Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Five Journeys podcast, Live Like You Matter. I'm Dr. Wendy Trubo. This is Dr. Edward Levitian, and our guest today is Kara Fitzgerald. So hold on to your seats because she's amazing. So Kara Fitzgerald, ND, IFMCP, is the first ever recipient of the Emerging Leadership Award from the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute in recognition of her work on DNA methylation. As a leading voice in the intersection of nutrition, epigenetics, and aging, her work has been featured in media outlets such as Prevention, Fast Company, MSN, Everyday Health, and many more. Receiving her doctorate from National University of Natural Medicine, she's on the faculty at the Institute of Functional Medicine, IFM, and is an IFM certified practitioner with a clinical practice in Newtown, Connecticut. Welcome, Kara. I didn't ask you, should we call you Dr. Fitzgerald? You want, like, how do you want to be addressed? <laughs> Uh, but you can call me Kara. That's fine. Awesome. I'm Wendy. This is Ed. Uh, yeah, we're 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 we we're we, cash. we don't go. <laughs> so cash. I'm really excited because uh, your book is awesome, and um, we were just talking offline that it came out January, right? Mm-hmm. You said yeah. So yeah. Uh, younger you. So how do you get younger? Everybody wants to know. <laughs> Wait, hold it's on. Before easy. we get into that, how'd you get into this? Like, oh, come like, on. I wanted to still how to get you, you, have to, you have to set the stage. How, how'd you even get interested in, I, I can't stand the term anti-aging because it implies you're not aging. What you really want is aging gracefully and without the chronic illness and disease. So how'd you get into all of this? Well, you know what? It's it's a little bit of a long story. It's an interesting story to me. So I, I like to share it, but I give you, you know, carte blanche to just shut me down, interrupt me, especially if I get a little bit too, too arcane. You can ask me to define stuff or, you know, whatever we need to do, because I can get into the rabbit hole. I, and so the, 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 the revelation for me was really diving in and tussling with the literature on epigenetics on gene expression, on what, on the variables that turn genes on and turn genes off. And that happened in around. So uh, Kara, I already have a question. What caused you to get interested in that? Yeah. So as a, yeah, that's a good question. So as a physician practicing functional medicine, um, the, the question, you know, it's, we're always trying to translate science into uh, how we might apply this clinically. We're always in the process of translating and, and how we might use it. We're early adopters in functional medicine, I think. And so I'm, um, and I have a background in laboratory science. I'm just kind of a geek at heart. I, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to what's going on in science. And uh, a lot of papers were, were coming across my, my desk on, um, on epigenetics and um, particularly in relation to cancer. So most of the science out there is looking at gene expression in cancer and how the tumor microenvironment the, takes over gene expression from us and turns on genes to promote its own survival, turns off genes that would inhibit its growth. Um, and it does this, one of the key ways it does this is, is through something called DNA methylation. And I'm suspecting you're both physicians. You've thought about methylation. You periodically we measure homocysteine. You've, no. yeah. So you're thinking about yeah. it with your we, patients. We love you're, methylation. We love epigenetics. Our audience, we talk about it almost every episode. So yeah, all the time. <laughs> okay. We love it. So in all the way back from, you know, my time as a, a postdoc in a clinical laboratory, we were measuring, you know, the methylation cycle. We were looking at the various analytes involved in making um, s methionine, the, the, the universal methyl donor. And so just to the very beginning of my career, I was thinking about methylation. Moving into epigenetics, because at the time, you know, epigenetics was kind of a distant um, science. Uh, But again, flash forward to 2013, um, looking at DNA methylation in the tumor microenvironment, it's not a simple, let's make more methylation, let's push methylation forward. Um, Imbalanced methylation is happening in cancer, in all of the chronic diseases. Actually, in COVID, you can see this. There's so, or so in infectious acute diseases, you can also see uh, gene expression really get wonky. So methylation may be absent 
where it should be happening on the gene, and it, it may be in excess. So, so uh, in thinking about DNA methylation, if there are a lot of methyl groups, and in the scientific literature that's denoted by a red, you can see a red lollipop, that's the methyl group. And on a promoter region of a gene, if there are quite a few red lollipops, that inhibits transcription from happening. So that gene is not able to be turned on. You can just visualize all these red lollipops. They literally block um, transcription, that transcription factor from getting in there and turning the gene on. Uh, Conversely, if there are a few methyl groups, that gene can be turned on and expressed. And so in disease states, uh, imbalance is happening. So it's not a simple case of let's throw some folate at this person, let's throw some B12 at this person, let's give them extra choline. It's not that simple because that's pushing methylation forward. That's adding red lollipops. The question has to be, where are those red lollipops going? You know, yes, you may want more, but you don't want them turning off a protective gene, an anti-inflammatory gene, a tumor suppressor gene. So there's this whole conversation that I began to, you know, perceive from the literature through the lens of functional medicine that really kind of stopped me in my tracks. And that was my entry into this. And being in a clinic where we are very nutrition centric, so we've got this biochemical background, but we're also nutrition centric. It occurred to me that we could build something out. We could build a diet, a, a, a dietary pattern that did two things. One, it supported methylation. So it supported, you know, with B12 and folate, et cetera, from nutrients. But it also gave the second class of nutrients, which was a huge aha for me to get into it, that seemed to be able to direct where those red lollipops were going. Furthermore, when you go into the literature and you're looking at DNA methylation and lifestyle factors, these guys are as potent as anything in the methylation cycle. So if you look at exercise or if you look at sleep or if you look at the research on meditation or the absence, so if you look in the research on stress or the lack of exercise, you see how influential it is favorably or not on gene expression and specifically DNA methylation. So it seemed to me we had these extraordinary tools to build something out that could support healthy DNA methylation very much through a functional um, lens. And that, and we started to do it in 2016. We wrote up a, 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 an ebook and we sold it sort of in, in, in the, on our, on our website. It was directed towards other physicians. It was written, you know, it was written in professional language. Colleagues were interested. I, I, gave a pre presentation at the Institute for Functional Medicine. I actually lectured on it in Ireland and, you know, really kind of around the world. The, our little tribe of clinicians were interested in this. Then the question was, are we really changing gene expression? Are we moving DNA methylation here? You can't write a lab slip and send somebody off to Quest and evaluate that, <laughs> especially back then. Like you couldn't. So this was all hypothetical. We were, of course, hoping. We were building best evidence, et cetera. We were seeing nice changes with our patients in clinical practice. Um, miracles of miracles, Brent Eck, the CEO of Metagenics, has been a big supporter of our work. And he and I were talking about this um, actually at IFM in San Diego, the IFM AIC, our annual mothership in, in San Diego. And I want to say it was like 2017. And he agreed to fund, a, fund, fund us. So we were able to do a full randomized control trial. We were able to hire a clinical research center actually at my alma mater out in Portland, Oregon, uh, to run a randomized control uh, pilot study. And that was extraordinary. Now, I want to just layer on to this at that time, there was zero evidence that we could change, that we could reverse biological age. So we measure biological age looking at DNA methylation. That's how it's done, and we'll talk about it more. But there was no evidence that that could change in humans at the time we started our study. Um, that didn't come out till 2019 when we were just crunched. We were at the end of our study pre-publication that the first trial in humans was um, published. Uh, so I was confident we were favorably changing epigenetics. I wasn't holding my breath that we were going to move biological age, but I knew that those that the clocks that measured biological age, looking at these patterns of DNA, well, there was one clock at that time we could look at. 
So it was a part. The other very interesting reality is that when you look at gene expression, when you look at these patterns of DNA methylation in chronic diseases like cancer, as I mentioned, but cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera, all of these, these diseases that happen in the aging journey, they look like aging. So the changes, the predictable patterns of aging that enable us to have a biological clock kind of overlap with some of the diseases of aging. Isn't that amazing? And so it was logical that we would want to look at biological aging. So I didn't jump into this as, you know, an anti-aging expert. I'm a, you know, I'm kind of a workhorse functional medicine doctor, a little on the geeky side. And that's how we got into it. And of course, our first finding was, you know, something that stopped us in our tracks and got a lot of attention around the world. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a behind the scenes geek, you know, I'm a little bit shy. Um, it was extraordinary for us to see that we had reversed biological age in eight weeks uh, using a diet and lifestyle intervention. And, and by, by three years, we had reversed as compared to our control group. So you can imagine how extraordinary it was for us, uh, you know, as, and as well as, you know, the larger kind of scientific community, but the, the world itself you sort of came knocking on our door. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah, now amazing. we have this book. Yeah. So let me stop there. I know that was a, that's a big story, yeah. but it's interesting, isn't it? It's really interesting. Uh, it, did you do a follow-up study? Like after the pilot was done, did someone agree to, to fund a, a full-on longitudinal? Just, I mean, it's so expensive. Let me... Yeah, it's really expensive. Well, let me tell you at that time. So you it, it's epigenetics the, and the prices of the tests are changing at a breakneck pace. At that time it was $1200 a pop. So it was yeah, it was an expensive six-figure study. I'm I'm just again so so grateful that I had this chance to do it. Um now you can get a test in the research setting, same thing, you know, really measuring the, the, what they call the methylome, but really, you know, a good chunk of those red lollipops for about, you know, $200. So it's gone down considerably. And now we can, as, as physicians and even consumers can access uh, certain tests. So it has changed. Um, you don't get insurance coverage. You still can't send people to Quest, but I think that that time will, will also come. Um, so we published our study in, in, in April 2021. And, and, you know, we were sort of midway into, we were into COVID, right? We were in the early, yeah, no, we were midway into COVID. COVID, when we unpacked our data, it's funny, the timeline is around my study in COVID. So it was October 2019 when we were in, um, uh, we were in McGill. We were up in Montreal with Dr. Moshe Seff, who was, who was one of the authors and an advisor for us. And this was when we were starting to see what the, 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 our amazing findings. And then COVID kicked in. We published our study. And shortly thereafter, I was given the book deal. Concurrent to the book deal, so just to answer your question around research, we partnered with a company to build an, to build an app out to really kind of build a do-it-yourself turnkey uh, Younger You program in an app. I walked in IRB. I worked really hard to get the IRB, so Institutional Review Board approval, uh, so that we could continue to study within the app. Um, it's it's actually been a harder journey. <laughs> I mean, you know, you guys were talking to me off the air about, you know, learning how to publish a book and the whole journey of that. Yeah, it is funny. It, it's, I'm picking myself up and dusting myself off a lot. So for as far as continued research, we, I don't have a nice big massive cohort that I'm going to get to publish on soon, but I do have, I am going to be able to write up some case reports. We've got a handful of folks who've finished and who've adhered well to the program and we're, we're going to publish um, a couple of case reports. Uh, once we get this app streamlined, we'll, so the, the IRB is kind of sitting in wait right now, but to your cool. point, I yeah, will get back great. to this. I have two questions. I, I have like a thousand questions, but I have two questions that I'll specify down to you. One is a really nuts and bolts. Are, can you tell us what your favorite epigenetic cust consumer driven test is? to get to, to order, you know, the $200 test, what's your favorite one? Um, I, so we're working with true diagnostic now. Um, and they Is do there any have, other ones? I thought that was the yes, only one. There's 
No, nope, there's a handful of other ones. So there's okay. Zymo. Uh, and they're a good lab, actually. Zymo is a good lab. It's actually they're not. Their Zymo is their research hat. If you look up my DNA age, that's the name of Zymo's kit. So Zymo, Zymo's a research lab that has created a con- direct to consumer a spin-off and they're offering a biological age test, which it's proprietary, which I think I don't love for research. I want to know what they're doing, but they but they did base it on the original Horvath clock and and they are a very reputable lab. So that's an opportunity and that price point isn't bad. I would say for anybody who does that, who works with Zymo, just if you get your baseline through them and get your follow-up through them. Um, True age is another small test that's um, or true me. True Me uh, is a is a small sort of more affordable test. Again, it's proprietary, but um, I you know I also believe that they're you know doing their best work. True Diagnostic is using the same array that we used in our study. They're working with Illumina, the company that we used, and so I you know I'm just comfortable and familiar, and I, I like what they're doing. Oh, and no, consumers can order all three. <laughs> we're having dueling. Like, wait, I have one more question. Go Thank you it. for that. <laughs> what were the characteristics? I, wanna, I, wanna. I know. I'm like, no, don't say anything. <laughs> what were the characteristics of the people who took really well to the program and maintained it? What was it about them that they maintained it? Because that I think is, that's where the rubber meets the road of like, how do you actually make true lasting lifestyle change that sticks with you over the years and reverses your biological age? What were those people? What did they do? What was that like? What What was it about study, them? What did like they do? the, de- mm-hmm. the those folks? Well, yep. listen. Let me tell you that I was like, this is my one chance. I get to do clinical research now. I'm being really, truly funded to do something. We're not screwing this up. And of course, you know, in like diet and lifestyle interventions, adherence is horrible. I mean, I think that's where this question is coming from. We know adherence is horrible, and we know nutrition studies are notoriously they're just poor quality. Um. My, I locked a nutritionist onto each participant like glue and they followed them around <laughs> <at home. laughs> and they like tased them. That's funny. And, no, um, I know that's actually, that's not, that's not really true, but, um, <laughs> not fully I, true, right? <laughs> like I have one chance to do that. What we did, I think what made an extraordinary difference is that our nutritionists, worked with the study participants. And so it was built into the study protocol that they needed. They were required to meet with a nutritionist at least once a week more if they wanted. They were required for once a week for the first month uh, and then uh, less than that, I think every other week or something like that, we built into the IRB. Um, and they ended up they ended up really maintaining those relationships. And I want to say something interesting about it. Uh, so that piece was essential. When we the look accountability. at accountability adher- yes, and when we look at our adherence data, they're impeccable. I mean, I would like to just publish on that to demonstrate this. The structure worked. Um, people were also excited. We, you know, they knew enough about what the study was that it was new and kind of radical that they were getting to participate in this. It was the first study of of, of its type. I know. Um, I want to be. I want. I want to do it. I'm like. I want to do it. Yeah. You do know. It. Well, definitely, I, it would be great. Let me. I want to say one more thing though, just because I think it's interesting. Our nutritionists weren't allowed to do sort of motivational interviewing, the kind of coaching, the kind of connection that we have in clinic, where you know you're you know you're really cheerleading them. We had to have. They had a dry IRB approved script. Like you can imagine, do you have any questions? You know, did you, that's, it had to be to go through IRB. It was dry and boring and yet it still worked. That point of contact still worked. So most of our, our study participants were sufficiently adherent for us to get significant findings. There was a little bit of, you know, some guy absolutely refused to give up his, 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 X amount of beers each week. It wasn't terrible. Another guy was like, I'm not getting it. You know, I'm, I have to have my rice or I'll lose too much weight or something. You know, there were a few exceptions, but really for the most part, people did well. I think what's so poignant about that is like, we so underestimate the impact of accountability. Even when the accountability isn't motivational or, or kind or warm, it's just, you know, not that they were unkind, but they're just dry. So it makes a huge difference to know I'm going to be talking about this with someone in a week. So I got to stay well, on the straight and narrow. I mean, we were we actually literally just had a staff meeting right before this, and we were talking about that exactly that because in our practice, we 
we want people to see our nutritionists because it's not necessarily to learn about nutrition. That's part of it. But it's also to have accountability, to have knowledge is not always power. It's always about just getting people accountable, talk, having somebody t- that you know you're going to be talking to. Yeah. So it's so important. So it's great. Yeah. In fact, what we've done in our practice, and we still get pushback from, from new patients, we've built nutrition hours into the structure. So if you work with a physician here, you have to, by extension, work with a, a, a nutritionist. And plenty of people will say, I know how to do it. I've already done it, blah, 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 blah. And no, we've just learned over the years how important it is. Yeah, we, we, ours is probably 80 to 90% of our people. We're, we're not 100%, but... I think the response to that also is like, if you know what you're doing, then you stopped growing and developing. And it's time to get you in with nutrition so that you can open up again. Like go back into discovery and go back into questioning and and not knowing it all, right? Like I don't, yeah, and I don't think, um, you know, and I may be mistaken, but I don't think we've ever had a patient come back and say that was a bad use of time. You know, I knew it. I knew everything that the nutritionist told me ever. I think they're always really, you know, grateful for that support as, as regardless of their, you know, their training or education. Okay. So let's go back to the study because I have, rec- I have now have, you, now do I you have, have questions? questions? Go for it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, so you found that, that eight weeks of intervention noticeably significantly reversed the biological age. And then, yeah. and then. Did people notice a difference in their experience of life? Are you were you even allowed to ask those questions? Because well, we did. Symptom, well, we did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We so we did. Yeah, we used the standard F of you know IFM um, MSQ, but we also used Promise. We used a bunch of validated um, questionnaires as well. Not so. Our study was. I want to talk about eight weeks just as the time because that's that's interesting in itself, um, but. In terms of how people felt with bioage reversal, we were looking at healthy people. It took us about a year to get our cohort uh, because we had to screen out. You know, people weren't on medications. They were already on the. They were already living pretty well. Pretty well. They were. Most of them were exercising. Most of them had good dietary habits. So we didn't see remarkable changes with regard to their symptom. Uh, questionnaires, their quality of life questionnaires. We didn't even see remarkable changes. with. Re- we looked at a handful of standard biomarkers, like a standard lipid panel. We looked at a standard chemistry. You know, no, not non-significant, uh, not even trends. I would say in quality of life questionnaire, we saw a trend towards increased energy, a trend towards less anxiety. So some suggestions, but really nothing much. And I think that that just speaks to how healthy um, our, our cohort was. Did you measure biometrics? Like, did you do a bioimpedance analysis or any look at like, what was their mus- muscle quality, quantity, water before and no. after? No, kind. no, we didn't. Mm-mm. We okay. didn't. It's, um, again, these guys were, these guys were healthy. In fact, since we had a bit of a structure around exercise, there were at least a couple guys who had to pull back on what they were doing and drop it down a little bit. <laughs> um, and I think if we did BIA, we wouldn't have seen a remarkable difference. Now, if we looked at type 2 diabetics or pre-diabetics, I mean, no, no question, we would expect to see a difference. And we might even see a greater bioage change because, you know, anybody with a chronic condition and diabetes has been, you know, well characterized to be uh, biologically older. Folks with that diagnosis, six to nine years is in the literature. So maybe we would see a bigger change. And then with some of those biometrics, I would anticipate we would see a difference. We saw, you know, some of the guys lost weight. Some of the guys had to work hard to keep enough calories in to not lose weight. They didn't want, you know, so it wasn't, it, 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 these were not the questions that we were setting out to answer. I can tell you, again, going back to the aging epigenome, these ch- changes happen in an aging epigenome, um, and in particular, the volume turns up in middle age. So this was a healthy middle age population. Like we really wanted to isolate those changes of aging, um, and it's specifically in, in in healthy folks. So we could, you know, really look and study that and see what we could turn around. Um, and how big was the cohort? Oh yeah, 
they, they, so the, the, the whole group was 43 and we finished 18 in the study. And was it only men? It was only men. Yeah. We needed to, um, make that decision because we couldn't afford the numbers. That, so if we had brought women in, middle-aged women between 50 and 72 would have been pre-menopausal, peri, and post. We would have all groups. Right. And for us to be able to tease through the influence of hormones, um, we, we felt like we would need larger numbers. Yeah. Thanks. So, the culture women are complicated beings. Yeah. Yes. Women are, I, I, know. I, I have experienced that firsthand. Thank <laughs> yes. you very much. <laughs> I know. It's such a, I mean, as a woman, as the, as the PI and being a woman, I've had to answer this question understandably and I, a, a lot. I, um, I can say in the first group that will, the first group to finish the Younger You through the app, the Younger You program through the app, was, it was all women. And so we'll be publishing on that. And I can say that they did great. They, we used a slightly different clock, so it's not an apples to apples comparison, but they actually did a little better. <laughs> Go, girl, Go <power>. ladies! <laughs> yeah, um, but it's not it's not a one to one comparison. Can we switch over to stress and talk about the impact it has on our biological age, our clock? Does it do things to D, to DNA? What does it all do? Yeah, so. We can, I just, I should distinguish, people bring this to my attention sometimes, I think it's worth distinguishing between um, short bursts of stress, like the experience of exercise or anticipation or the, the, the energy you might have before an exam that you've worked really hard for and then it's done. That kind of stress actually can be strengthening for us. Um, certainly the stress of exercise is, is extremely helpful. It just, it turns on, you know, really important physiologic processes in the body that, that are strengthening. Um, but yes, the chronic stress that we experience here in our world, the, the, the stress of, of working too much, of not having downtime, you know, raising families with tight budget, moving through COVID, the COVID isolation, et cetera, et cetera. The stress experience, um, is profoundly pro-aging that I mean it really is in the book I call it I say it's gasoline on the fire of aging and it might be the biggest variable you know we're 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 ready to fight the tiger but we're sitting in our you know in our desk chairs not moving I mean it's just the, it's just such a yeah and we're fighting the tiger all day long you know, it's not that short burst experience with some recovery in there, fighting the tiger or, or climbing the tree. Um, so stress really is is toxic. This chronic stress exposure is just toxic on the body. It just really breaks it down. The clock that we used, um, which is the kind of the flagship, the first clock, Horvath 2013 multi-tissue clock, um, a full 25% of it is influenced by glucocorticoids. So it's influenced by the stress response. Wow. There's no other variable. I, I want to stop you for one second. 20, yeah. 25%. That's like people talk about, I have good genes, I eat well, but like 25%, that's huge. It's Sorry, huge. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just like, I just want to like, just to pause Underline on that. Underline it. That's like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, that was my, uh, experience, you know, of, of sort of internalizing that information is, it's bigger than any other variable um, in influencing, you know, gene expression. So how, yeah, on the, on the hierarchy of what's aging us most, you know, where is, is stress number one? Is it at the top? I mean, it's a huge player. And we don't take it seriously. Like, again, just thinking about our practice, you know, when do people say, oh, yes, okay, I'm going to really de-stress. In, in my clinical experience, it's always the end of the line. We've done all the diet and, 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 and you know, various biomedical interventions. We've corrected their lab data, et cetera. We've done all of this sort of um, mechanistics 
functional work and they're not quite where they want to be. And, you know, even though we've had the stress conversation since day one, I'm thinking about being in Fairfield County where a lot of my uh, patients will commute by train to New York City. I mean, it's changed. It's definitely changed post COVID, but there's, you know, and there, and, and there's, there are a lot of women in my practice and they're raising families and they're, you know, doing something high powered in the city. And it's real, it's this relentless, relentless push. And it's only after everything else is corrected and they're not quite where they want to be that I find a willingness to dialogue about the stress experience. It, but it can take a while. And I have to, you know, I would be lying if I didn't say that I went through some version of that myself and still struggle for sure with, you know, running my own business and being a clinician and raising a kid, et cetera. So um, it's a huge, huge issue. And it, it really needs to be pre- appreciated on how f- physiologically toxic it is. This is like this. Why can't I see anything? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stress, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's a big deal. Yeah. And you know what? We can we can total life stress. The epigenetic imprint that can happen with that can be handed down. I mean, you can pick up PTSD on the epigenome from previous generations. I mean. Certainly in during pregnancy, early infancy, you know, when imprinting is just massively happening, when those epigenetic changes are just, you know, big and active. Um, so now, now you've added guilt to the mothers. Seriously, on the I'm show. like, oh that's, my god, I was. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Except, guys, you're right. You're you're in there. I mean, your epigenetic imprints. Um, on on the D- DNA and sperm will ap- absolutely influence. Um, in fact, you? we can we can put you under in the in the guilt column. Like if if you over if you ate, not even necessarily overate, but uh, sufficient or robust amounts of food in pre adolescence. Pre adolescence. I, I love this boys study. in boys, not in girls have has lasting health, health outcomes on multiple generations so how you were eating when you were 10 <laughs> this is a, this is the sweden epi, is the sweden and the epidemiological yeah, 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 yeah. people god yeah, i listened so to that on weeks. npr for yeah. like 2 hours and i was riveted it's at, so and, interesting I mean, it was yeah. just amazing cuz yeah. the because what was so amazing to me was that the two generations down if your grandparents had feast at puberty yeah. Yeah. You died six your, years earlier. Your grand um, your grand your grand your granddads, not mom. Right. You're two two okay, so your granddad, two generations, yes. you died six years earlier, or you lived twenty five years longer if they went through famine when yeah. when they went through puberty. So, so it's not, not all my not mother's quite, fault. No. Isn't it like a thirty We're year good. spread? No, you can't blame your mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't blame yeah, your yeah, dad. Yeah, um <laughs> And then, you know, we can just see, you know, PTSD and total life. Like we can see psychic experiences yeah. will yeah. be translated into biochemical marks and those can be handed down uh, as well. Yeah. It's pretty so, extraordinary. What's a girl to do? I think we need to, like, I'm always interested in what are the practical tools that will alter someone's trajectory? Yeah. And well, so, so we know that, we can change gene expression actually relatively quickly. Um, actually, very quickly in some cases. I cited weeks. a study in the well, and I, st- I cited a study in there just showing the exposure to pollution. I mean, it's unfortunate that it was a toxic subject, but changed gene expression in the population in four hours. I mean, there was a rapid shift in gene expression. Um, certainly, and we can, but we can also see like a single exercise event or a single meditation uh, can favorably change gene expression. But if you imagine, you know, just going through cell replication, so, you know, generations of cells and, you know, the DNA is dividing as well, the more that you're practicing a habit, the more that it's going to spread to, you know, generations of cells and, and be more far reaching. So this is certainly one way to kind of frame why habits are, are good, because it has this really lasting and impactful and more broad uh, potential. But it's nice to also see that one good habit can make a difference. So even if you're having your first meditation, which we know is like total monkey mind and crazy, you're actually doing your body good just for the effort, which I think is kind of cool. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, just I, I, breathing. I mean, I, just, but I have just, to just know, parasympathetic breathing is going to make a difference. Cuddling. 
Tell yeah, us about well, we cuddling. I know. We, we, okay, so we couldn't put that in our study. It's kind of a funny thing to joke about. So you guys will cuddle. You guys won't. No cuddling. Eight weeks, nothing. <laughs> so we couldn't exactly control for that. Um, but yes, oxytocin is um, is really important in in gene expression and um, the experience of love. So oxytocin being the love hormone is uh, is very impactful and. Um, anything that's going to support getting that up. So, so engaging in cuddling, I mean, it, and it, it can be your kid, it can be your partner, it can be your pets, you know, just, um, there's just longevity promoting by a, by a variety of different me- mechanisms, actually longevity promoting, uh, effect. So yeah, community, you know, just community and contact and interaction. So essentially also. the blue zones, the blue zones is the yeah. trick. It, well, yeah. One of the <laughs> yeah. Lessons from those ones, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, getting enough sleep is just incredibly impactful on gene expression and longevity. If you are not sleeping, your your aging is is accelerated. I mean, it's really as simple as that. Uh, if you're do you have some guideposts, well, Kara? We, so, in our study, we wanted people to get seven hours, um, and we would just of pr- sleep or time in bed. Just to be clear, because people like I spent seven hours in bed. I'm like, that means you slept for six hours and fifteen minutes. Yeah, on if you're lucky. Right, right, right. So, we wanted seven hours sleep. We wanted we wanted them to shoot for seven hours sleep, and and so we would just provide sleep hygiene tips. And I go I go through a bunch of hacks in the book because of all of the pieces of the Younger You program, sleep was my weak link, and I had to figure figure it out. You know, and and all of the basic hacks. I think one of the biggest ones for me, to your point, was getting to bed on time, so I actually had the runway to get enough hours because I have a set time I need to get up in in the morning or I but I have a young kid at home who's gonna wake me up whether I like it or not I'm getting up mommy mommy Um, mommy yeah (laughs) totally um so if I if I wanted to sort of have some indulgent adult you know stay up a little bit later at night I mean I'm I'm not going to get enough sleep so getting to bed early was huge for me sleeping in a cool room you know making sure it's dark or um using um eye and eye mask or something. But anyway, sleep. So sleep is important. And ideally I'm getting seven hours. Yeah. And I track it. I use an aura ring. I love tracking it. I love making sure I'm getting sufficient deep sleep and REM and, and, you know, making the tweaks to be able to do that. So sleep is huge. Exercise is, uh, as longevity promoting exercise is just ridiculously potent. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary how beneficial, uh, exercises. It's not just g- disease preventing, and it is disease preventing of really all of the chronic diseases of aging, to my knowledge. It's um, life extending. It's both. Is it cardi- cardio? Is it strength training? Is it interval training? Is it stretching? What, what's the, is there yes. one or yes. two things that, because <laughs> everybody has that question, right? And yes. everybody answers it differently. So yeah. What's your I think, answer? I think I think that so in our study we had people do a modest um, we we were we did cardio in our study and it was just a minimum of thirty minutes five days a week perceived exertion uh, sixty to eighty percent of max so it was just a basic simple prescription um, I dug into that a little bit and and that's if people want to do the younger you intensive that's the ask um, the literature suggests that resistance, that they're all good, that resistance, high intensity, and cardio are are smart. We want to maintain our muscle mass as we age. We want to just, you know, we want to keep a robust muscle mass. So we want to do our resistance for that. Um, but we want to, all of the benefits of, of a good cardiovascular experience. And if we, you know, th- layer in a little bit of high intensity where we're pushing ourselves, um, I think it's, I think that collection. So it's a mix. I, I think, yeah, I really, I, I think Which it makes is. Sense. I and, and I don't even, and if you talk to muscle scientists, you know, those muscle builder guys that are, I, I, we're, we've just been thinking a lot about protein. And so I've been tuning into this and, and, um, they're going, they're proponents of resistance. Uh, but then if you talk to the, you know, the expert who's also, you know, a marathoner, they're going to be pushing right. cardio, but Ultra, my read on, <laughs> triathlete and <laughs> yeah, my read on the literature is that all are important. I will though, going back to ultra, um, we can do too much. I mean, there's not a ton of evidence out there as far as it, 
being pro-aging as measured by epigenetics. Um, there's one study that I that I cited in the in the book. But we know anybody who was a competitive athlete knows at the end of the season you get sick. You know, you can tell that there's this immuno suppressive phenomenon. I mean, I, I used to compete and I got sinusitis at the end of my season every every year. And and if you want a good group of people who don't have enough secretory IgA, get athletes post season. <laughs> you know, it's like I had if you want, if you want to study. Athlete. Yeah. I had an Olympic athlete as a patient and it, it was years after she stopped competing and we were just starting to untangle the adrenal dysfunction that occurred from pushing through and pushing through and pushing through and, and just that relentless training that she did. And so I, I think it's, it's pro aging. Yeah. So even though it hasn't, it hasn't been studied in the, in the way that we might l- like to see, there's enough evidence out there to see it. Yeah. And it's it, your, what you're describing is it makes sense to me and it's very, it's very interesting. So I don't, I, I, I loved getting to have that moment in my life where I was a competitive athlete. I wouldn't change it for anything. And, you know, if I were doing that, for a lifetime, I, I could see that it would wear me down. Yeah. 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 So I feel like we're just scratching the surface of this conversation. And uh, maybe maybe what we'll do is we'll do part one and part two. But but in this part one, what, um, you know, at the end of this conversation, even as a conversationalist, I'm thinking, okay, how do we reach you? How do we follow you? How do we stay engaged with you? Where do we get some programs? Yeah, where, like do, peop- where do people learn more about what you're up to? What are the top things? And we'll make sure to put them in the show notes. Um, all Things Younger You is, you can find at youngeryouprogram.com, All Things Younger You. So all of our, our you know, we're going to, we're the, the groups that we're doing. If you want to come in and work with us one-on-one, you can do that. Um, there's just all, there's cool opportunities. We have an app uh, soon to be launched. We finished our beta testing. And so that, that will be there for the do-it-yourselfers, but we're, we'll be using it across the board and all of our, all the people who want to work with us. Um, Younger What's you that program. called? That is called Younger Together, Younger Together. There, and there'll be a cool community feature. So it'll be in an app, but you'll be able to connect with other people going back to our conversation on community. Um, we have our cookbook, companion cookbook coming out uh, November 8th. And um, that is Better Broths and Healing Tonics. So it's a way to, to drink your epi nutrients. Cool. Um, but you, Sounds it, awesome. It, it is. It's, it's, it's such a cool I like the titles. Book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. And then I just want to bring people, if they, if they want to, they can come over to drkarafitzgerald.com, which is not just me. It's my entire team. It's our clinic. It's our podcast. It's our blog. And, you know, there's just a ton of content um, on that website as well. That's really great. Awesome. Thank you. So thanks for listening to another episode of the Five Journeys podcast, Live Like You Matter. Our guest today was Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, and you can find her all about her in the show notes. Definitely. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Thank you, Kara. It's been amazing. Thanks for being here.